Great. So uh, thanks very much for coming. We'll, we'll kick off then. I just wanted to say a few brief words just to set the scene for a discussion today um, with Sir Terry Leahy and Danny Finkelstein here on what government can learn from successful business. Very hot topic right now. Um, coalition government obviously came to office uh, a couple of years ago now promising to make very big reforms in schools, health, welfare, pretty much every area of government. Um, there was a huge job to do, but obviously the, the most important thing was looking at the deficit and bringing that down. And reforming the public sector was seen as the, the most direct uh, and possibly the most dynamic way of doing that. Of course, this creates huge debate, um, how to cut public spending while still giving people a good deal on the taxes they pay. How do you deal with the social problems that drive up a lot of the public spending uh, that we see in the first place? And that's what the public services project that we're now running here at Policy Exchange is, is all about. How can you change cultures in government, bring in new expertise, new providers, new ways of doing things, and much more choice for people? And of course, there are opponents of that change. I remember in government, um, I left this summer, I remember some big debates internally about some reforms that were going on and the controversy it created, debates between unions and ministers. And what often happened is that the public's view can be ignored when you've got all this, this uh, argument going on. So one of the first things I did here with uh, Policy Exchange was a piece of research looking at what the public think about the public sector and about issues of reform. And genuinely objective uh, polling that we did, as well as a review of, of what's gone elsewhere. And it's very clear, actually, that the public really want change. And a word that they often use themselves is that they want to be treated more like customers. They understand that public services are different. They're public goods. They're not, they're not commodities you buy off the shelf of... Uh, Tesco or anywhere else, um, but they want, they want that level of service. They, they want to be able to switch if they don't like something. They want new providers. They want more choice. So, so we published that research last month, and we're going forward with, with some new research um, to look at how to deliver that change. So there's a real appetite for reform. The big question, of course, is how you deliver it. And very lucky for us today to have Sir Terry Leahy, who is an expert in delivering huge change across huge organisations. He famously um, joined Tesco as its chief executive in '97, and, and really turned the fortunes of that business around, pushing through some pretty radical change against some opposition, um, some new ideas that hadn't been done before. And he took that company from a period of some difficulty through to being the biggest retailer in the UK with a growing international presence. Uh, he's done a great book, by the way, a, a bit of a plug. We've got some books on the back there if anyone wants to have a look at those. Um, I've read it. It's a really good read, Management in Ten Words, um, and do grab a copy later. Um, of course, Terry won a, a string of business awards and a knighthood, so... It would be great to listen to what he has to say about what government can learn from business. And we want this to be a genuinely open discussion. We want you to, to fire in questions, thoughts, um, points uh, to Terry, to each other. So chairing this, um, th this is Danny Finkelstein, who's our chairman here at Policy Exchange, but is also executive editor of The Times, its chief leader writer. He regularly appears on the media, commentating on all things uh, political so let's, let's give, a, first of all, a, a bit of a welcome for our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sean, and I'm uh, very pleased to welcome you all here to this event. I know you're in for a treat because I already started talking to Terry upstairs about the economy, and it was so interesting I nearly forgot to come down. Um, so... But I thought, really, it would be ungenerous of me not to share it with everyone else. One of the, uh, one of the things, of course, that we, we talked about uh, upstairs was, was some of the lessons that, 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 that sort of inverting the question almost that the uh, private um, 
the private sector can learn from the public sector, and we'll, we'll definitely want to talk about that. But I thought it would be nice to uh, start with something that's, that's outlined in, in your book and is very interesting, which is uh, your personal history, and which, is, which is an important part of uh, your sort of understanding of how a business works and how public services work. Yeah, uh, well, I was uh, born in Liverpool. My parents were Irish, so in a sense, I was uh, uh, an immigrant. Um, my mum worked in the NHS. Actually, she worked as a nurse before the NHS was, was formed in the Blitz in, in Exeter. Uh, my dad never really had a regular job because he'd been severely wounded in, in, in the Merchant Navy uh, at the time. And uh, we grew up in a council estate in Liverpool. And, and um, my big chance came with the Catholic schools. They put very good schools into these areas. And I was able to then win a scholarship to probably the best school in, in Liverpool, which was the scholarship was paid for by the council. Uh, and then I was able to win uh, you know, a grant to go to university. Uh, and that process really got me out the council estate and sort of lifted my horizons and aspirations. So uh, yeah, I've got a very strong sense of what uh, good public institutions can do uh, for an individual. Um, but also uh, when it came around to uh, Tesco, I remember shopping uh, with my mum she had four sons, so I was the sort of daughter she never had, and took me shopping. And uh, yeah, I remember how poor the stores were. You know, people sometimes look back with rose-tinted glasses, but actually, for most people, food, shopping was pretty poor. 1960, the time I'm talking about, 60, 63, 40% of everything you earned went on food. You know, today that's 8%, and the choice, the quality, the variety is infinitely better. Uh, and so Tesco always attracted me because actually it seemed a way that you could, in a small way, affect the lives of most people. And I also liked it because you were working with people I grew up with, sort of ordinary people in the stores uh, and on into the business. Well, I, uh, the, your book um, begins, is, is sort of when it talks about management in 10 words, begins with something that's very important in political strategy as well, which is truth. And I thought what we'd try to do as a sort of baseline for the discussion we're going to have is establish what you think the truth is about public services and institutions in Britain. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is they are vital. They play a vital uh, role. Um, and the, the, you know, the, 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 the lessons that they can teach to the private sector are about a service ethos. Some of these institutions, schools, hospitals, universities have been around for a long, long time and were created for a social purpose, which people really adhere to. Um, there's a great sense of vocation in many of the uh, public services. Um, uh, also, there's a great... Um, selflessness, a great generosity, you know, people are not thinking first about how much did I earn or, you know, how can I get up the greasy pole, they're thinking about the job that they're doing. Uh, and also it's very inclusive, you know, the, the, the services uh, cover everybody, not just uh, a niche, you know, or a target market or whatever. Now I think the best private businesses reflect that as well, I like to think Tesco tried to reflect those things, but not all private businesses do. And, Certainly those who believed, you know, the credo of amoral markets and so on, um, uh, you know, I think that that led them in the wrong direction. I think you have to have morality in business and you have to have business which are clearly based on uh, clear, articulated values of behaviour. Uh, and I think you can learn from the public sector about those things. And much of what I'm sure we'll discuss this morning is about good and bad organisation as it is about public and private. You can have good and bad organizational practices in both the public and the private sector. But I, I would say there are certain things in the private sector which tend to encourage good organizational behavior. There are certain signals there around competition and price. Do you, do you, what do you think of the, the sort of whole idea, the sort of ideological idea that what policy exchange is, is interested in, you know, delivery of public services is a bit of a fool's errand, that really the best thing the government can do is just not do so many things. And um, <clears throat> trying to, because, because 
inevitably in certain services, um, but also politically in others, the, the signals are missing, you'll never really get the quality of delivery in the, pro in the public sector you have in the private sector. And the best thing you can do is just not do so much. Well, I, I think there's something in that. I mean, I think, I think politicians have tried to do too much. And if you look at uh, Europe, I think too much of our everyday life, our economy, our society is managed by governments. It's, you know, over 50% at the moment, isn't it, in most developed economies. And I, I think they're trying to do too much. I think also when comparing with how a good business is run, they, they lack a strategic focus. You know, this, this, this attempt to do so many things. Now, I know governments have to do more, politicians have to do more, but so many things tends to lead to a lack of, uh, you know, laser-like focus on the one important thing that you have to do. It also uh, tends to result in too much legislation and regulation, and we might come back to that because that in itself causes problems, not just for the public sector, but for the whole of the economy. People, actually, I think it's well, let's, just... Let's stay on it now instead of coming back to it. Let's, uh, so it would be interesting both to focus on the experience in the public sector, but also on your own experience with Tesco in that. Well, I don't know if anyone's done the statistics. You might, somebody in the room might have done, but, but I, I think regulation has grown much faster than the economy in developed economies over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. It's not a party political thing. I think, I think politicians of all hues, they reach for legislation and regulation too readily to solve problems. There are other ways of solving problems and meeting uh, social objectives political and social objectives. Um, and actually, in the end, they should trust their citizens more. Uh, and we'll come back to that, because the key to a successful business is you actually have to trust the people in it. Uh, and I think they should trust markets more. And uh, you know, you've got to have regulated markets and policed markets and so on, but they actually should trust them more. If they did that, they would have to fall back less on regulation, prescription, uh, legislation. One of the things that's a uh, constant, uh, sort of, if you work in the media, you're constantly saying politicians should have known about that, they should be involved in that, they should be responsible for it. But you rather lean against that. You think that. Um, we should be holding politicians, in a sense, less to account for some of these uh, delivery issues, and that your delivery would be better as a result. Do you want to yeah, explain how that would work? I do. You can't know everything. And I, I sometimes think that the standard of public accountability is set unrealistically high, whereby the politician, the civil servers, servant, is meant to know everything, never make a mistake, and never waste a single penny of the taxpayer's pound. Uh, and I think that's just unrealistic. In, in, in business, you make lots of mistakes. There's lots of things you don't know about, but the owners of the business are content with that, provided that in the round, you run the business well, and it creates benefit, creates value, uh, and then that's shared out in different you ways. Must, you must have, in Tesco experience, serious failings in a part of the business that you had to put right. And uh, how do you set about determining who should take the fall for those things? Uh, you know, and there's the problem at the moment, the West Coast Main Line. Who, who should take the fall for serious errors? And how did you make the decision about how that was done and how should government do that? Well, I think you do have to try and put accountability in the right place. And, and if you contrast it, I, I, I think directionally, I think politicians themselves should try to get out of management and administration. They should get up above, much higher than they are now, in setting strategic direction and focus, using regulation and legislation much less, trusting their own institutions, their citizens and markets more. That will help because when it's, it's not a great mix, management and the democratic process. Um, I, I think then beneath that, the public services uh, might also change its form and b become much more a commissioner of services, a procurer 
of services, which is a real technical skill. And you, you see in the examples of the West Coast rail line and some other things we could talk about where that skill isn't really there. Now, if you contrast with the food industry, an Asda or a Tesco, we don't make any food. This is a vital service. We rely on thousands of suppliers all over the world, but we have to be expert at procuring, commissioning, and supervising that provision. Uh, and, I, and I think that would be better because then the actual production and provision of those services could be done in a competitive environment. And the thing that forced Tesco to address the truth, to face up to its shortcomings, was the fact that it would have gone out of business if it didn't. We were made to be better by Sainsbury, by Marks and Spencer, by Asda. And, and I think the great shame is uh, some of the public services and the people in it don't have that same opportunity you know, to, to actually be brought up against the things that really matter for the citizens that they're serving. Okay, so policy exchange is, uh, favor, has always favoured um in its research and in, 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 in its interests, the whole idea of devolution of public services and more choice. Um, but the criticism of that model is that it basically involves, in schools, say, the competition of myriad corner shops. Um, and that actually, if you look at the successful business, that isn't really what you did. In order to create Tesco, every Tesco pretty much looks the same. And uh, it was quite, it was a group of people at the top who were driving a strategy, admittedly not running everything every day, but you didn't let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, you, you, uh, you basically sold um, uh, self-raising flour in exactly the same way, if I can put yeah. it that way. But the big difference is that the form that Tesco took was actually shaped by the competitive process. It was actually the judgments of customers uh, who said, if you don't give me those things, I'm going to shop in Sainsbury. And they did, of course. Uh, and then when we started to do some things differently, they started to shop in Tesco. And then Sainsbury had to learn some new things. And I mean, it is true in competitive markets that one of the features that is used is economy of scale. Uh, and so you will tend to find that markets start to you know, concentrate. And, and at a point, government has to step in just to make sure that there still is choice. But actually, if you look at the food industry, there's still lots of choice in terms of who manufactures food and who retails food. And you see new ways of delivering that, whether it's online or as value retailers or luxury brands. You know, these things still do emerge. If you've got a single monopoly supplier, whether it's in education or in health and other things, it's more difficult to get that kind of innovation and diversity. Now you see government becoming much more, uh, you see the purchaser provider split becoming much uh, tougher, uh, more uh, clear distinction between purchaser and provider and the government should Well, well I say that you know, not for political reasons, but really in terms of if I was trying to do it, what structure would make a more effective organisation and delivery of the service? But of course, the, the problem, some of the problem with that is um, the government is then handing quite a lot of power to people it finds extremely difficult to control. And it does have to take, you know, the, the realities of politics are different. You have to, you will have to be accountable for the mistakes and um, even the large salary bonuses paid for by suppliers, which a company like yours doesn't have to worry about or didn't have to worry about. Well, I think. Um I mean, of course, you know, businesses too are accountable. You're, actually, first of all, they're accountable to their customers and are punished by customers, rightly, if they don't serve them well. And then they're accountable to various extents to their owners and to, to their employees and to, and to the communities that they work in. So there is accountability. I, I, I just think that the accountability in, 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 in the public sector needs to be separated and located at the right levels. You, you know, you don't need the political pressure and accountability affecting everyday management in, an, in a hospital or in a school. It actually gets in the way. One of, one of the great benefits for an organization is everybody knowing what is the single most important thing. What are they there to do? And if that is to create benefit for a customer, you know, that really provides a clear dynamic focus. 
When you look in the public sector, you, s you don't see that always. You see a mix between what the citizen needs, what the expert thinks is right, what the unions think they need, what the politician thinks they need. And, that, and that's not a great mix. And that's why when you're in the front line, you get these, con and my wife's you know, in the, a doctor in the NHS, you know, my, my sister-in-law's a nurse, you get these mixed signals about what's really important down on the front line. How do you get people to, to simultaneously do stay, you, you want people who are prepared to stay broadly within that? Uh, can I just make another related point about accountability? Yes, you know, people are accountable. I was accountable. Uh, politicians are accountable. But that, you know, part of that is you have to accept that you're going to place trust in other people. You know, half a million people worked in Tesco. I couldn't control them. So, you know, I would be held to account for their actions, which I couldn't totally control. And I knew it was more important to set the broad direction than it was to try and control every one of their actions so that I never, you know, had a problem. How, how could you simultaneously get them to... As you, have to take account, as you have to be accountable for their behaviour, how could you simultaneously get them to, to work within the parameters you were setting, but also have the confidence to be bold, right? Because obviously in public services, there's that problem all the time. Yeah. How do you get people to innovate enough? I think, I, think um, I mean, one of the words in the book is, is courage. You know, and I, and, I, and I actually think that politicians, we should, we should as voters, expect them to be more courageous on our behalf to set more visionary ambitions for society. Um, what you don't want in organizations is a kind of managerial incrementalism where you just drift along, you know, and don't take any risks because that's a recipe for decline. And a sense I had growing up in Britain is that some parts of Britain thought that was their job, you know, a managed de relative decline. And I, I don't think that's necessary. I don't think that will produce great organizations or institutions. And it's not about how we should relate to the rest of the world. So you want a boldness in, in uh, you know, a vision, in uh, courage. <coughs> in and then actually within the organization, you need courage, personal courage. People are very fearful in organizations. And I, and I see a lot of it in the public sector. And what are they fearful about? They're fearful about breaking a rule, upsetting their boss. They might lose their job. They're not really taking a risk on behalf of <coughs> the people they're serving. And that's what you want to encourage them to do, to innovate, to take a risk on behalf of the, uh, you know, the citizen or the consumer. Now, to, to have that happen, you, as the head of the organization, have got to be prepared not to punish people for taking a risk. And when I look across at the public sector, I see too much punishment of people who break rules and take risks. And, uh, you know, I know you're dealing with people's health or you're dealing with finances and all those sorts of things. But, you know, in the, in the food sector, you, you've got the same, some of the same issues going on in terms of food safety and, and everything else. Can I ask you what your experience was of customers? This may seem like a slightly odd question. To what extent were the customers interested in Tesco as a brand and all the sort of process issues about how Tesco as a company operated? And to what extent were they just interested in you delivering them food at the right price? In other words, how, how um, important to the customer was your role as a corporate citizen? It is important. Uh, you know, every person is both a consumer and a citizen. Uh, I think in Britain, um, the, you know, the first need is as a consumer. You know, they, they, they want their weekly wages to go as far as possible. They want a better life, better material life. And your best social contribution as a retailer like Tesco is to do that job really, really well. Um, but also, when you talk to people, they do say, look, you know, I think you're great to me uh, as a consumer, as a customer. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, what you do for the community. And so you do have to demonstrate that, A, the way you run your business and the other things you do is beneficial uh, for, for the community. I mean, the reason I ask this question is because I think politicians are much more focused than they should be on the process 
of how they do things uh, and the image of how it's done and much less focused on delivery. And I just wonder whether that was your impression as well. Well, I think there is a sense of that, and I think that may come back to this, this, this um, unrealistically high accountability, which is also addressing maybe the wrong things, accountability about process rather than accountability about achievement and outcome. And, you know, I, I watch with dismay when politicians or civil servants lose their jobs because of some process failure rather than really looking at you know, the outcome, the output, uh, the achievement. I'll say another thing too, uh, you know, about accountability and targets. One of the words in there is balance. And there are techniques you can use, we, we call it the steering wheel, whereby you, you, you've got to think very carefully about what are the right objectives to have in each part of the organization. What are the right measurements? Often I see organizations that have got the wrong measurements, they're measuring the wrong things, and it causes the wrong behaviors. And often measurements are conflicting. And that's a particular issue if your organization is trying to satisfy unions, management experts, politicians, as well as citizens. You know, the problems at the border control, you know, couldn't happen in a supermarket checkout. Um, the, 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 and, and, and that was, I think, because of conflicting measures or conflicting objectives manifested right on the front line. Just, uh, just to explain that a little bit more, because it's very interesting. Well, if you, if you contrast it, you know the plane is landing. You know, it takes off from somewhere, so you know exactly how many people are going to come through. It's the easiest thing in the world to, you know how long it takes to process a person to actually staff and open it. I mean, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, we introduced one in front, which is, you know, if, if there's more than one person at the checkout, we open another checkout and we built more checkouts. Uh, we, you know, we, are, we have heat sensors, so we know, and because in food, you don't know when people are going to turn up or what they're going to buy. But we have heat sensors that they know when they come in the store. We have heat sensors on every checkout all over the country, so we know exactly at any time how many people are queuing. And, you know, because we've got a single objective, which is to give good customer service. Yes, although, of course, what you will imagine is if you can get the queues down, your revenue will go up and that will, uh, that will pay for the staff you're putting on yeah. the queues and the problem they've got in the border services. That isn't true. That, that is uh, a, you know, a, a big challenge for public services, which, which is uh, you sometimes get perverse incentives. Uh, and people have often said to me, and I know, um, you know I, I run a really, really good school. Uh, I've got you know, 10 times the demand for my places, so the local authority doesn't give me any money because I'm already full. Uh, and you can see extremes where the bad schools are getting two and three times per pupil funding than the good schools. I remember a doctor saying to me, it's all very well you doing that, Terry, but the better I am, the more patients I get, and I don't get any more money. You know, the better you are, you get more customers and more income. So, you know, I think, I think um, the public services need to find a way to align incentives against the outcomes they want to achieve, you know, reward the behavior you seek. And it can be done. I mean, obviously, a pricing mechanism is the simplest way. Competition is another way of aligning uh, behaviors against the important objectives, because competitors make you do that. But also having the single focus on the citizen rather than you know, it confused between the politicians' needs, the unions' needs, the experts' needs, the bureaucrats' needs, and the, uh, and the citizen. That, that helps align it as well. So I, I want to open it to everyone, but one last thing is about the sort of temper of the times. So there are two views of austerity. One is this is the opportunity. We're now in a genuine crisis. No one can deny we have to do something about provision of services in this climate where we don't have any money. This, is, this produces political will. We were discussing this upstairs, and that's perfect. The, the other moment is, uh, the other argument is, actually, it's a bad moment because people are fearful of their living standards, and you haven't got any money 
to make imaginative reforms, much of which require investment. So this is a poor time. The best thing to do is to nip and tuck your way through this and tackle the big problems afterwards. What, uh, uh, what is your uh, choice between those two broad views? Well, if you can, you know, and, and, and it goes back to that word truth, if you can face the truth and say, look, we can't carry on as we are. We can't, for example, in Europe, afford the welfare system that we have promised. Um, then this is a good opportunity for change, for innovation, for new ideas. And uh, similarly, actually, in terms of something like sustainability, it does bring forward new thinking. Um, and uh, the, the, the big changes in Tesco came in difficult times because when we had to change or we would have gone out of business. We had to try new things. We had to take uncomfortable risks. So, so that is the best time. And, and actually, in, in business, the, you know, more great companies are founded in recession than they are in boom times because people have to try something new. Good, right. Well, I'm going to give uh, other people a uh, chance to ask questions, which is foolish of me because they won't obviously be as good as the ones I've been asking. <laughs> but give it a try. Who wants, to, who wants to be the fool who has a go? Oh, Dominic, you'll have a better question than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so your wife works in the NHS. The logic of your position, which I agree with, is that what you want is competing hospitals, uh, competing on quality, competing on outcomes. Um, what does your wife think about that as a proposition? <laughs> um, <laughs> My wife suffers a little bit from uh, a problem of British education wh which, which never speaks about wealth creation and surplus and uh, basically allows the idea to grow in people's minds that if you want to do good, you go into the public sector. If you want to make money for yourself, you go into private business. And I think that's a great shame because actually wealth creation is a noble pursuit and it's a terribly effective way of meeting social objectives. So it, what I would do is I'd wind the clock back and ask for all of our pupils to be taught about wealth creation and its role in social objectives. Because she has gone in like a lot of brilliant doctors who just never imagined, well, what is the place of the private sector or the profit motive in delivering a public service? I just need more resources to do the job. Though she is, you know, now frustrated by uh, the, 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 the over-managed front line, I'll, I'll, I'll put it like that. Um, yeah, I mean, if you contrast the, the, the provision of food, which is a vital service, with the provision of health care, which is a vital service, actually the industries are about the same size, a bit over 100 billion, aren't they? But the way food is provided is you have a separation of the manufacturer from the distributor. So you get a purchasing, a commissioning tension there. And you have competition within each of the segments, and as they're against Tesco or Unilever, against uh, Nestle or, or whatever. And of course, you have a pricing signal. Um, now, you might not be able to replicate all of those things, but some of them, I think, could uh, make a difference. But, but, but also, some of the organizational behaviors have been forced by competition in the right direction. So, for example, we do empower people close to the customer, I think, more, because we found in competition that's the best way to perform. I, you know, I spoke to the head of a hospital, a very prominent uh, physician, and I couldn't believe the extent to which his actions were prescribed from outside his organization. And I said, well, just tell them to bugger off. And he said, you don't understand, Terry. They have legislative power. They can fire me if I don't tick this box and do that. Now, in management, in businesses, that's seldom the case. You know, you, you do have rules, but you don't have them embedded in legislation in, in that same way. I mean, my, the headmaster of my old school, I, I popped to see him, how are things getting on. It become a comprehensive now. It's now just becoming an academy. What's it like with the local education authority? Well, I, he said, I'll tell you. Um, as the headmaster, I like to keep in touch with the pupils. So I see a group of them every week. We have a cup of tea and a Kit Kat. Well, the health advisor came down from the local authority and said, the Kit Kat's got to go. <laughs> so I said, well, tell them to bugger off. 
He said, I can't. They, can, they could literally just remove me from my post. It's a paradox, okay, because you said on, on two occasions there's too much punishment in the public sector uh, and too much fear of failure. But does that surprise you? Because the general perception is that actually it's very, very hard to get dismissed in the public sector, partly because of the strength of unions. It's much easier to get punished and dismissed in the private sector. So what you're saying is very different. I would say so, yeah. I'd, I'd say bureaucracies are very fearful places. They're a terrible form of human experience, actually, bureaucracies. Uh, the way that you're, you know, separated from your colleague and you're siloed and you don't know what's going on around you. Uh, and then you just sort of get rules going in and you push rules out. Uh, and people are very fearful if you talk to them. Uh, and as you say, you know, there's not huge risk, but they're still terrified. And that, that fear transmits itself to an over-control, an over-management of the people in the front line, whether they're shopkeepers or doctors or, uh, uh, or, or policemen or in the army. Andrew. Andrew Carner, a former civil servant. Um, John Brown has been involved in bringing a number of uh, uh, industrialists, business people, uh, into government departments to sit on their boards and hopefully improve the governance and, and efficiency of government departments. But what do you think would be the best way of bringing business expertise and principles and effectiveness into government, particularly into the provision of services? I mean, is it by putting people as non-executives on boards? Is it by having a revolving door where business folk come in, work for a few years, and then go out, as happens much more in America? Is it by simply saying there are parts of uh, government activity which really the private sector should do and not the public sector? And where does business really most effectively come into the public sector? You know, it, I'm sure it, it, it can come in at all those levels. And, uh, you know, in the past I've been involved in some of those sorts of meetings. Um, if I'm honest, I think it, it's better that the... the, 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 the the public sector does less and asks business to do more through commissioning and procurement because bringing in kind of management advice from the edge uh, without addressing these other problems of conflicting objectives uh, and the absence of uh, aligned incentives um, is difficult, I think. I mean, look at the experience with management consultants. You know, the government spends more on management consultants than, you know, businesses do. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't let them across the threshold at Tesco, actually. Nobody was allowed to appoint a management consultant unless I knew about it. Um, we made, we had some good advice from management consultants, but it was pretty limited. And, and the, the problem is, they're giving advice. It'd be better that they were asked to run it and had true accountability, and then we could see how good they were uh, at actually doing it. Um, the, you know, when business people go into government, they often don't do very well. Uh, and if you talk to them, it's because the, the, this environment of, of, of these mixed objectives is not what they're used to. It's, it's actually quite difficult to run effective organisations with these conflicting objectives. Right at the back. Um, you mentioned perverse incentives, um, and I work for a group called Social Enterprise UK, and we're looking at the moment at the big outsourcing firms and their behaviour. Um, I suppose I wanted to ask your opinion on how, I suppose what's happening at the moment is that the very large outsourcing firms are very good at winning contracts and making the market as opposed to delivering great services. And I was wondering about your ideas for bringing together the actual users of the services, your customers who are coming through Tesco, versus your commissioners, um, who at the, mo at the moment are the people that the large outsourcers are trying to please. Yeah. I, I, I think that a goes back, I think, to this problem that, that the government needs to develop its skill base at commissioning, procuring, and supervising service delivery. Um, because you do see companies that are better at winning contracts than delivering them, I'd say. Now, I, I think that that's a, an absence of a skill on, on the government's side, which they can develop. Um, you know, in Tesco, um, 
All I can say is we don't, we don't contract in anything like the same way government does. And now some things are completely different, you know, building an aircraft carrier or whatever. Although actually putting in a food infrastructure is a 30 year time cycle. Um, huge capital investments, incredibly sophisticated supply chains, huge technology implications. Um, there's massive investment that goes on, but the contracts are much, much, much simpler. And they're really more based on, uh, we'll give you the business, and if you do a bad job, we'll replace you. It will work with you in a collaborative way uh, through that period. But, but you know, the, you know I, I would struggle, actually, to write the kind of contracts government are trying to do, you know, with 15-year contracts, specifying the price of the services, specifying the profit margins, and all the rest of it. You tend to get wrapped up uh, in knots, and then that is an environment where the person who's good at negotiating the contract is the one that wins it, rather than the person who's good at actually delivering the service. But I think one of the great problems here is market entry. Um, for smaller providers when the contracts are already being designed and the size and scale that they are. Thank you. Down here. Just down there. Um, Richard Bacon, um, you said that management and the democratic process are not a great mix. Um, and um, yet most of us would agree that however bad it is, democracy is probably the best form of government we're going to get. Um, you wrote in your book, and I, I saw this first of all in the newspapers because it was quoted somewhere, and it was quite an epiphany for me because I've been writing a book about why government gets things wrong so often. Organizations are terrible at confronting the truth. It is so much easier to define your version of reality and judge success and failure according to that. Now, it is uniquely likely in government and in politics, particularly in politics, that people will fall prey to that more so than elsewhere without the obvious correcting mechanisms that you and your competitors would face up to the point where you would not only try to redefine reality but then, <laughs> if necessary, deceive people into believing that it was the truth rather than own up to failure um, because the price might be that you would lose power, political power, um, if, if you were honest. Uh, how do you get around that in, a, in an open and democratic and political process? Is the answer to be much more open and honest and fluffy about the fact that people will always make mistakes? I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but, but you know, our, our political process, give or take, you know, is, is accountability every five years. A, a little bit, the idea has grown that it's accountability every day. And, um, and as a result, the democratic process has flooded too much into every nook and cranny of service delivery or the political process has. And I think if it just withdrew and was more appropriate to the actual accountability, you know, the five-year accountability, it, 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 it might work better. It is very difficult, you know, uh, having a political row and political objectives when you're trying to build long-term organizations and service delivery. And I'm Alexander Stevenson writing a book about public sector management, Kogan Page, July 2013. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, one of the most striking differences <coughs> between public sector and private sector management is levels of compensation at the senior levels. Yeah. And I was just interested in your thoughts how significant you think that is from a public sector point of view, that discrepancy. I'm not sure. I, I think it may be coming significant. Um, I mean, the one thing, there's something, as I say, the generosity, the service ethos, where people put other things ahead of their own personal wealth is something that can be learned uh, by the private sector. I think the best organizations are like that. Some are, you know, and we've seen some examples lately, are less so. Um, but I think, and you may know the stats, I suspect the difference between the earnings of a top CEO and a, and a, and a top civil servant probably the gap has widened a lot. Is that, is that, I would guess that's the case. Now, the worry about that <coughs> is um, the talent follows the money. It, it's tempered by those people who put a higher uh, value on, on service, but it, to a degree, the talent follows the money. And, you know, my kids are going through university and all the bright Oxbridge kids are going off to the city because that's how they can afford to pay the rents to live in London. And... Um, the, the, the worry then is, do you have the talent in the public sector to, to deliver the wide and ambitious series of things they're trying to deliver? 
might not you be better to say, look, we'll be a smaller organization, effective at commissioning and procurement, paid well, and we'll bring the people, the talent who are paid well in, in competition to actually provide the service. You know, in Tesco, we used to have an in-house advertising department, but they were no good because we didn't pay well enough. The guys in the advertising agency earned much more, and they were just much better at the job. So we moved our advertising outside. I will just use the mi microphone, Nick. Thanks. Sorry the issue is the core public sector, though, those parts of the public sector that are, can't be made contestable and what you do uh, yeah. about those. I was wondering if I could ask you about another dilemma the government has, which is uh, how much it should devolve and how, how much power it should hand down. It's been part of the orthodoxy of the government's reform program that it should try and do that. We're in the temple of localism here a policy exchange in the belief that, 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 that power should be handed down. Um, but government uh, finds itself conflicted about that, wants to give more power to schools, then starts worrying about the standards of teaching in some schools and what should be taught. And that's a constant dilemma. For instance, it strikes me that Tesco as an organization was uh, very grit that your store managers, you know, how much discretion did your store managers have in in a, in a system where you, know, you knew a lot, you had a great deal of information about what was happening. Um, so I'm very interested in this sort of tight, loose, what you think is the right tight, loose balance? I, I mean, the best balance is, is you know what's going on, but you don't control what's going on. Uh, and what you sometimes see is people trying to control what's going on without first knowing what's going on. Uh, and uh, I, I would say that um, Britain is, is too centralised. And it's this mix of, of centralised power in London and also this, 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 the, the tendency in bureaucracies with this uh, you know, belief of daily accountability actually to be overly controlling and you know, controlling too much in the classroom, controlling too much on the hospital ward from you know, 200 miles away. Uh, and that, that is in contrast to the best private organisations where, you know, the, of course there are rules and of course there are reports and so on, but the people feel empowered on the ground to make the decisions that are necessary to be taken on the ground. Michael Heseltan and I did a little report about Liverpool, and, and one of the things that became clear there is that if the great Victorian cities are to become internationally competitive, it's the people in the cities that have to have responsibility for that. That's why I supported a mayor. You know, you've got to have the levers to pull to succeed or fail. You can't just sit there waiting for Westminster or Whitehall to give you a subsidy or tell you what's going to happen. And you've got to have competition between cities, uh, both domestically and uh, internationally. So I, I do actually think that uh, power needs to be pushed out. I know there are all sorts of problems that go with that, um, and I know why it's centralised 20 odd years ago. But it, I, I, I believe it's, it's the right thing, particularly if you're going to get a balanced economy in the UK. Hi, uh, Gareth Wong. Um, just a, you know, quick question. You know, being devil's advocate and um, You've mentioned a lot of great things. You know, it seems to me, you know, vision, courageous, you know, a lot of, you know, these things that are needed is actually need to filter down from the leadership point of view. But it seems to me there are a lot of um, environmental reasons that that might not happen because people think short term, you know, they want to please, you know, the voters, whatever. So do you see there is likelihood that this leader will come through to, to, to make this change you know, of, on this you know, 100 billion sector? Well, I hope so. I mean, I, as I say, I, th I think if, if politicians removed themselves a bit from the management administration and focused on uh, the longer term, uh, placed more trust in their institutions and in their citizens, I think that might be a better climate for those things. And, and you know, of course, businesses get things wrong all the time. But the point is that, that unless you get more of the important things right, you don't survive. 
that, that's it. So over time, you know, just Darwinism, you start to get more organizations to get more things right. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I, I was interested in your comment about wealth creation and what a negative attitude there is towards uh, wealth creation in terms of adding value to society. Uh, and I think it is, I mean, we've demonstrated as a nation that, that we can achieve uh, enormous um, accomplishments. I mean, the, the Olympics is, is an example of that. Uh, and I'm sure that if we apply some of that talent to the wealth creation problem, that will solve a lot of our social problems as well. But how do you go about changing that culture? Because it is an exceedingly negative environment at the moment. Um, well, it's not easy, is it? But, but, but I think that if um, we as a society expressed uh, more clearly the, the values of the society, the things that we thought were important, the things that we wanted to be and achieve, and how we thought we should achieve that, that would include, I'm sure, wealth creation. And if that were taught into the schools, that would help. It's not almost that people are negative about it, certainly through schools. They just don't think about it. You know, the, there's... there's a large number of perfectly decent people have just never been taught where their wages come from. Uh, hello, my name is John T. Um, what, two questions, and you can pick either one. Uh, if you were Prime Minister for a year, what would you do? And the second question is, what did working at Tesco teach you about British poverty? British poverty. I think you should answer both. I, th I think I'll go for the second one, actually. <laughs> I think the first one is I I've learned you wear a blue tie on the telly. <laughs> the, the, um, uh, w w well, I think I was privileged in that regard because um, Tesco is in most communities, and so my job, I was able to you know, visit these towns uh, and see how they are. Uh, and actually, it's been great when Tesco's gone to places like China and Hungary and so on and so forth to see the development of those societies. Um, and we don't stay in five-star hotels. You know, we're right out where the people are. And it's always basically been successful when it's appealed to everybody. It's quite an inclusive business, Tesco. You know, the poorest and the richest shop in the stores. Um, I, 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 I've learned that poverty can be a trap, that um, if you take my council estate, it needed great institutions to go in and get me out, a really good church, a really good school. You know, um, Tesco's done a lot of work on regeneration, where we've put stores into really tough areas, and we've got people off the long term unemployed, thousands, not tokens, thousands. We've had to teach them to read and write, how to turn up for work every day. But they've done very well when they've gone in there. Um, and, you know, you have to have role models, you have to have hope and aspiration and all of those things. It has to be normal that you sitting in that council estate can believe that you can go on and, and uh, be, you know, a success like these other people that you see on the, on the telly. Um, the... And you can look at the components of, of, of poverty. Um, I, I think Tesco has made a good contribution in terms of the quality, the safety, the variety, the cost of food. And that's a bit, you know, as I say, 40% of what you spent went on food, now it's 8%. I've thought of a question. If you were Prime Minister, um, <coughs> <laughs> what would you do? Uh, I'm not going to answer that question because I'm not. <laughs> okay, so has anyone got uh, another question <laughs> at the back? Kieran Watkins, um, old Edwardian, so, someone who's uh, oh, right. had the Kit Kat and tea experience <laughs> from John Bajak. Um, just wondering how much um, lack of public engagement um, plays a, for a role in the culture change in terms of innovation and engagement um, at the policy level and whether communicating better could be driving uh, an understanding of government's role. 
When, when um, by the way, I more bad news, they stopped the meat pie after the rugby match as well. Um, the, the, um, the, the, w when I joined the board of Tesco as the first ever marketing director, I, I, it was the most miserable day of my life because failing CEO is always appoint a new marketing director. So, um, they, so that they can get fired first. So, so um, the, I didn't have any of the power of the big battalions in buying or in running stores and so on. I didn't have any power. So all I had was the research coming in from the customer. But actually, it turned out to be the most powerful thing. The, the voice of the customer actually was more powerful than the finance director, more powerful than the buying director, more powerful than the retail director. And so the trick was bringing the voice of the citizen and their needs right into the heart of decision making uh, and really let it be heard there and you know, let real data be the basis of decision making. I have found, you know, as I've been a, a bit around government and, and so on, a lot of important policy and legislation is based on pretty shaky research, what I would call pretty shaky research. They don't really get to the bottom of it and really get underneath it and know what the issues are uh, and what the best approach is. Okay, I've got one. There was one more, just a bit further forward, Jess. Did you want to say? And that's probably the last one. Hi, uh, I'm Paul. Uh, I work at Pulse Exchange. Um, so uh, the idea that the, the private markets can um, generate innovation, typically ha there's a failure component in there. And, and you've discussed that, um, you know, th that there has to be this ability to fail. Uh, but, but many of the areas of public service provisions are areas where failure may not be acceptable, or, or at least there's a very strong political reaction. So child services not intervening early enough, you know, leads to the loss of life. This is uh, very difficult to reconcile with the idea of a, a, a store not delivering what the customer wants. They go across the street to another store. So to what extent um, can we introduce failure in a way that's, that's acceptable and that, that can lead to this innovation? To what extent are, are we talking about uh, two very difficult to reconcile things? Um, I mean, the, you know, as has already been said, there are maybe some core services which it's more difficult to bring in competition and so on. But, but actually, in the provision of a lot of services, you can have competition, you can have failure, but you can also have, you know, government control, you know, political democratic control of the provision of those services. Uh, you know, as we've been discussing, one of the sad things is that in organizations that can't fail, you've got a massive fear of failure. And, and it's that daily fear of failure that's actually getting in the way of good service provision. Well, okay. Unfortunately, we haven't got any more time. Um, and so we'll have to uh, wind it up. We had a tremendous audience uh, today, and you did actually, in fact, ask even better questions than mine. And so thank you very much indeed to all of you for that. But most of all, thank you to Terry Lee for his answers. Thank you.